episode of Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me, as always, is Mr. Chris Hellstrom. How are you today, Chris? I'm doing all right. I see what you did there with the announcement. You so saw it, but did you hear it? Of course I heard it. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. As of this recording, we are in the throes of the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. So I'm a very happy camper okay. right now. Yeah. The this ticket the Kings no have sense. made it? Kings have made it. They're up three to two in the series right now. Uh, and I don't want to go any further than that because that's I might not age well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. But no, I'm 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 excited. There's a lot of hockey on TV. So um Sweet. Yeah, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. I'm doing all right. Yeah? Yes. Good. Well, that's good. Like what are that. we talking about today? Well, just like you alluded to there with the announcement that we're going to talk about vocal distance, really, to a vocal mic. Yes. And uh, hopefully you heard there that you sounded really far away and got really close and had a lot of proximity effect there. So that's what we're going to start yapping about today. Hint, hint. Yep. Go Not for it. Not even a hint. Kick that's in. It. Yeah. Kick in. Well... As with everything, that it, there's a lot of movable parts here, right? But we're going to do um, deal just with vocals today. So the first thing that makes a difference, of course, is what mic you're using. Right. Right? Yeah. What kinds yeah. do we have here? I'm thinking generally we got condenser mics. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know, AKG like a 414 or, you know, we got the Telefunkins and yeah, condenser mics tend to be a little bit more expensive, sound a little <laughs> bit better. But of course we have also, we got dynamic mics, right? So we got like 57s and 58s and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, 441s, it, yeah. Yeah. And we can even go as far as like recording vocals with a piezo mic. Which you have talked about before. I have. But that's very, very rare occasions that those tend to happen. But yes. That's a little bit more esoteric, but it can be done. It right? can be done. Then again, like in SM58, if you're on a little bit more of the budget scope, like a 58 is what, like, I don't know, 100 bucks or less, probably. So. 99, man. Get that $1 out of there. <laughs> yeah. So that, that will make a difference. And how would you say that? That actually makes a difference of how we're we're treating a vocal performance with, with those three counts. So let's let's forget about the piezo for a second, but but we're dealing with just condenser or the dynamics. Well, the first thing that I would want to think about is the distance from the mic in terms of how are we measuring this, right? And before we hit the record button, you're expressing to me that you talk about a hand width, yep, of distance. And I immediately thought to myself, well, what if the person listening thought hand width meant just the the flat distance between the, the front and back the of their hand, of your hand, the thickness yeah. of their hand, instead of it being perpendicular to the mic to the mouth? That's rather close, in my opinion. So I would extend that out to at least two hand widths of your pinky to your index finger and then pinky to your index finger of your other hand. And I say that because I don't tend to use the products that put the box around your head. Right. Because if yeah. you have a product that puts a box around your head to kind of make it quieter so you're supposed to get a better sounding vocal, you are probably about one hand width away from that microphone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that's you've got true. a box yeah. around your head. If you don't have a box around your head, that's awfully close in my mind. However, yeah. for me personally – as a vocalist, I am usually not much closer than on average about a foot to a foot and a half, maybe two feet back from the mic. And I know wow. my hands are not that big to get two hands that not a is not wide. two feet <laughs> wide. <laughs> yeah. The reason why I say a hand width as well is because I'm generally measuring that necessarily not from the mic itself, but from the, the pop filter. Sure. Well, hand. there's but always a little bit of difference if you are using a pop filter. The pop filter that I tend to have on my mic, the, my main vocal mic, which is a C12, mm -hmm. the distance of that is... Just about a finger width <laughs> right. from, from the front of the microphone screen to the pop filter itself. I've had previous pop filters where I could set it at a fair distance, like a good four inches away from the mic. So that's 
a way to help gauge how far back from the mic you are. Right. And it's also a good way actually from stopping the the singer from getting too close as well, right? Because if you got Yeah, if you need a singer that needs to be like, put back yeah, from the mic, you stick that pop filter far back from them and they can put your mouth right up on that pop filter and still be away from it. Yeah, indeed. So I get that. Yep. So why do you say a hand with? Because I like to get, you know, again, this is very content dependent, right? Yeah. Singer dependent, but it's just to get that intimacy of the vocal. So mm -hmm. I end up, we, we'll touch about on this a little bit later on, but a certain proximity effect so that we get a little bit of that warmth. If it's a singer that is really comfortable in the studio and tends to project a lot more, mm -hmm. obviously I'd ask him or her to, to back off a little bit and they probably won't need me to tell them that if they're so inclined, right? Right. But if there's somebody that is just a little bit green, shall we say, that just I want to make sure that they don't get too scared and start backing off and the the sound of the vocal will, will suffer. Well, I can agree with that, but I'm also going to say that that distance is going to be heavily dependent upon the mic pre and the gain staging that you're running for that mic. Totally. Yeah. Because yeah. the more gain you've got coming in that mic, chances are the further back from the mic, that singer is going to be standing from it. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, is the more gain you've got going, the closer they get, the more it may actually distort, but they're also passing a whole lot more volume through it. So that's a pretty big deal right there in my mind. Yeah. But you tend to start then with those like two hand widths. If, if it's a singer that you don't know, for example. Oh, no. I, I, yeah. I let them stand wherever they feel like they're going to be comfortable. Oh, wow. You are so forgiving. I am. <laughs> and then if it's not working, I'm going to adjust them forward or back. That makes sense. You yeah. know what I mean? Right, right. And the reason why I do that is because I want the singer to be relatively comfortable when they start. And if it's something that is easily fixable for me, based on where they feel comfortable standing back from the mic with the gain stage of the mic pre, it's sure. easier for me to do that. Right. If that's not a good case issue... And I'm in an environment where the surrounding environment tends to suck, which I don't do a whole lot of. But if that's the case, then yeah, I am going to want to get them closer to the mic. And then I'll work the pre-gain stage of the mic pre down so that them being closer isn't going to be a huge issue. Right. So I don't yeah. have a general hard, fast rule of like, oh, they must be two hand widths or a hand width away from that mic. Because to me, yeah. especially with the mics I tend to use, getting a hand with the way, you're starting to really hear some some of the effect that we're going to talk about down the street here. And for yeah, me sure. to get a closer vibe also depends upon the content of the song. Right. If I'm going with an alt rocker who is screaming at the mic, generally they need to be a back away from that mic. <laughs> right. And I'll raise the gain a little bit. I also have a bit of a specialty case in how I'm working with at least a few of my mics in that I have a mic pre that is very different from most other mic pre's. Yeah. The vibe pre, right? Yes. The group tubes yeah. mic pre, which they do not, as far as I know, is no longer made. It has the ability with one of its settings to be able to change the impedance of the microphone. Yeah, this, That's being this is actually into really interesting to me because I haven't messed around with that as much as you have, obviously. Yes. But uh, yeah, please share. So the idea of changing the homage of the mic, one, you have to know that your mics can take it because it could actually damage your mic. And it's mm. not necessarily always a good case to do that. However, I think that's a really rare case that you're going to have a mic that it's going to damage it. But if you have an old RCA Victor ribbon mic... <laughs> the homage of that is going to be around 300, which is very, very low by comparison. But the beauty of those mics, man, I have sung through one of those and it is just heavenly. But to spend 40 or 50 grand to get one of them is something <laughs> I don't feel like I should do. Right. Oh, but, the, but the music is so important. Right. right? So yes, on, right? I agree. The music is important. <laughs> However, with a more modern mic that can take varying types of impedances, although generally more modern mics are going to be in the much higher range of around 2,400 ohms. 
they're going to react differently if you switch them from 2,400 to 1,200 to 600 to 300. Now, obviously, they're going to feel in their comfort zone in the 2,400-ohm range. If you switch them down to a 300-ohm range, you're getting an entirely different vibe going on. In fact, let's do a quick little experiment right here with it. I'm going to stay in the same spot. And just so people know is that I am using the GrooveTubes Vipri as my mic input on a C12. And this is my normal talking distance right here. And that is at 1,200 ohms. Now, if I okay. switch it to 2,400 ohms, do it. this is how it sounds now. Now, I've mm -hmm. lost just a tiny bit of volume, and it's not quite as thick sounding, right, at right. 2,400. Now, if I switch it back to the 12, this is at the 12, and you can tell that I've got a little bit more presence. If right. I switch it to 600, now I'm at 600, and you can tell that even though I haven't changed my distance, my volume's gone up a little bit. And a little bit more is happening in the low end. It's a little more, it's just, it's like I've gotten closer, but I haven't. Right. And then if I go to 300, which is here, now you can hear that I've got a lot more low end and a lot more oomph going into the mic. And that's, yeah. it's subtle, but it's there. Yeah. And I'm going to go back so to the So how would you, how would you go about that with, in, in a session when it's not you singing? Would you just experiment with that, or do you have a starting point? You start on those higher homages and, and then go from there, or I try to match you... it to the mic to begin, mm -hmm. right? So even though the C12 actually that I'm using should be at 2400, I tend to like it at 12, especially for doing the podcast. Now, if I'm singing hard, I'm going to put it at 24. Yeah. If I'm and just singing, so people, what, just so people know, you don't need to have a telefunk in C12. To no, 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 you don't. But that's the that's my biggest comparison is that. Right. But for a lead vocal and me wanting it, like if the singer really likes to be up on the mic on a lead vocal, I'm going to be choosing the higher homage because I'm not going to get as big of an effect on that closeness. Right. So to speak. Whereas if I still want a feeling of depth, but I want more room sound to it, even though I've got that depth going on and I still want like even more out of the room, I'll go to 300. Cause then you can stand back pretty far. You'll still get your same depth in terms of the feel of the vocal, but you'll also start really capturing a whole lot of the room right. along with it. And that's yeah. also very dependent on something that we'll talk about a little bit further down the road as well. But those are the things that you have to pay attention to when you're dealing with a vocal on a mic is right. getting that singer to feel comfortable about it. Yeah. That's and my big should, thing. And that's why I don't have right. a set standard. I let them feel out where they want to be on the mic. Now, this is also dependent upon, in my mind, whether or not you're using one of those really ridiculous contraptions that I actually dislike. And that's the box around your head thing. Mm -hmm. I think that is great if you're in an environment where you're just doing demo vocals, but that's not something I'd use for a, a real, like, pristine high-end lead vocal for a, a major, like, I guess, pop hit. That also being said, there's those things that they build that are supposed to be the the reflection capturers the reflection that they put filter. behind. Yeah, the, the thing that goes yeah. behind the mic on the opposite side, those things kill the vibe of the sound of a vocal faster than you can say Superman. It's <laughs> insane. I just, I wouldn't, I hate those things. I don't think they're good because you losing all of the spatial value out of the mic when you use that. Yeah. And I get why people do that yeah. because if you're in a shitty room, that has got a shit ton of, reflections that are awful, right. then maybe yeah. that helps a little bit. But I think that kills it more than anything. If you're in a room like that where you think, oh, I need one of these guard type things, move the mic to a new spot. Find out where the reflections are not happening and put it there. You're going to be so much better off by moving the mic to a proper spot in the room and then setting back from the mic with the distance that you're comfortable with to sing in. That's just me. Yeah. No, I think just to play devil's advocate, I think don't. <laughs> oh, kidding. I will. Yeah. No, I mean it's one of those things that you know you want to try. It's just a tool, right? If it can solve some issues for you, then great, mm -hmm. awesome. I would say, but don't count that that's going to solve every issue that you have in your room. Like, I don't think it's going to solve you. much of any issue. And generally speaking, I think it creates a bigger problem. I'm going to go the Al Schmidt method on that and just say put it in the right spot in the room. Right. Yeah. 
So we're not going to be sponsored by reflection filters. That's <laughs> <laughs> not likely. <laughs> yeah. Not now, anyway. <laughs> right. yeah. Not after this method. So. Yeah. And I would say also when it comes to um, the distance and the miking techniques and everything here that, you know, there are singers that are more comfortable if they're actually holding the microphone. Yes. Because they might they might use their entire body to get into the vocal performance, getting everything out of themselves. Right? Well, and that also makes it a lot easier as a singular vocalist using a singular mic, so to speak, to be able to control it faster. Yeah. Because if you're just standing there and the mic is on a stand, you have to weave and dance if move, you need right. to move. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's in your hand and it's handheld, you can immediately pull it back from your face. And I've seen recordings done with guys that like to hold them. I'm not one of those guys. Yeah. However, the big problem with a handheld mic in that regard, hand noise on the shell of the <laughs> mic. So right. I would cover that mic with some sort of foam for his hand grip or her hand grip so that when yeah. they're gripping the thing, you're not going to start getting a whole lot of low end rumble on the mic based on how they're moving that mic around. Right. And if you're a super aggressive singer, please don't cup the mic when you're doing that, you know? <laughs> so it, you don't want to be like, those, Bane, come on, man, let's sing like yeah. Bane. Yeah, it might look really cool on stage, but when you're, you know, the, the sound leaves a little bit to be desired, perhaps. All right. And so, with that, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor before we get into this effect that we've been talking about. And we're back. What is this ridiculous effect that we're talking about for the whole concept of miking when it comes to a vocal? Proximity effect. Yes. Yeah, that's worth a lot on the Scrabble board. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you the use proximity, it as a phrase. Right. But yeah, the, the, the closeness, how you get, if I'm backing up a little bit here and I get a lot closer to my microphone like this, mm -hmm. it's the proximity effect. You tend to get more low end obviously, uh, the, the closer you are to the mic, right? Yes. See, there we go. And that is something that if somebody is doing that, what you said, what they're, they're projecting, mm -hmm. you probably don't want them that close, right? Well, there's a few but, reasons why you don't want them that close. It's not just the proximity effect. No, there's, there's also several. the gigantic yeah, airflow over the head of the microphone that causes massive distortion and popping from it moving too far. Yeah. When it comes to an intimate type of a vocal performance, let's say that it's a ballad or something. Or even a Billie Eilish song. She tends that. to literally sing right up on the, the frame of the mic, from my understanding, which but is how she, she gets those really want... close whispering type layered vocals. It's the right up on the, the mic itself. Right. And is she one that likes to hold the mic? I think she is. I, you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but that would be good to know. But yeah, so that that's a, an intimacy thing, and it's a good way to kind of get that vibe out of a vocal if it if it needs to be close and passionate and that type of thing. Right? Well, to if you want it really to feel like you're sometimes. whispering in somebody's ear. Or that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there any time where that is a bad thing for you? The proximity effect? Yeah. Well, it does tend to make things a little bit more difficult when you're doing a mix on a vocal. Mm -hmm. If it's extremely pronounced, it makes it harder to EQ the vocal, in my mind, yeah. in my yeah. experience. I'm not one to really use a whole lot of the proximity effect, just yeah, for the I low think, end vibe of it in any way. Mm, I think to me, it really comes down to the the dynamics of the performance, right? Yes. Where, you know, if you are really up close in one part of the song and you have to back up for the next, and, you know, those are things that, that certain singers are really, really good at doing. Mm -hmm. But um, you should you see me do my two-step in the studio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see that next time. You have to shoot me a video next time you do vocals. Yeah. So that's the proximity effect. It's basically just how close we get to the microphone and we get all that nice low end and I use nice in air quotes there. So, <laughs> or at least appropriate. Right? Sure. How do you deal with background vocals then? Background vocals are a little different for me. Yeah. In that I will 
use whatever mic in a slightly different way. So say I use the C12 again for background vocals. And if I have multiple singers that are going to sing them all at once, I'm likely to set it to an omnidirectional mode. And that's something we didn't really cover a whole lot in terms of the different mic types. And let me jump back before I go too far into the the background vocal thing and include this with the lead vocal thing. Condenser mics, some of them have the ability to change the polar pattern. Like the C12 actually from Telefunken has the ability to change the polar pattern. And you can go from hyper cardioid to omni and a whole lot of varying degrees in between. Maybe you should explain that a little bit more of what that actually means. A cardioid pattern is a figured eight where the front end of the mic is going to have a certain narrow range where once you're out of that range, you don't get the same value as when you're right in front of that range. And what I just did was moved away from the mic into an out of the range of the polar pattern. And some of them go hypercardioid, which means that it's going to be bigger in the front end of the mic and much smaller around the back end of the mic, which means the back end is going to start rejecting a whole lot of the signal that's coming from behind the mic. Some mics are good at doing that, some are not. Now, when you set it to an omnidirection, that means no matter what direction you are around the mic, it's going to pick you up pretty much the same from every side and every angle of the mic. And that's what I mean by that. Dynamic mics are a whole lot less likely to have varying degrees or varying abilities. They usually are set to some sort of cardioid. And depending on the type of mic that you buy, they're going to reject the back end pretty good. And they're only going to be very focused on the front end. Right. And then when you have a piezo mic, which is a very rare occurrence for a vocal mic, that's something that literally most often you have to be right up on top of that damn thing, like swallowing it as you're singing on it. And yeah. there's no other way to get around it. Right. And that's the it, polar pattern that I'm talking about. That's an interesting part when we start dealing with background vocals and things, right? Depending mm-hmm. on how many people are doing them. If it's just one person at a time, then it's less of an issue. But Sure, because you can um, just set them it, right up in front of the front of the mic or if you have it in a hypercardioid. So that's the thing that if it's just a cardioid pattern and you have two singers, you set one on the front and one on the back and they're going to sound equal. Mm -hmm. But if you have like four or five people, that's where you see these videos of maybe older bands. I don't know if there's too many more modern bands that are doing videos of them in the studio as they're singing, where you see a group of guys or the group of the band standing around the mic in a circle. That mic that they're singing on is most likely set to some sort of omnidirectional mode so that everybody's being heard equally. And also another thing to keep in mind there, if we're using that, even if we have just a singular singer, is that we need to be aware of that, that if you have it in Omni, that you're going to pick up more of the reflections in the room and that kind of well, thing. Well, you're going to pick well. it up from every angle. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that does make yeah, a so, difference for your miking distance. Right. I remember seeing a documentary. It was about the Beach Boys. Uh-huh. Those guys were masters were, in the studio, man. They spent a lot of absolutely. time there. Yeah, and they were doing all their vocals at the same time. They're all around one mic. Mm -hmm. And the guys are, depending on the part that they're singing, they're taking a step forward or they're taking a step back. And just to make sure that they're going to blend properly in that. Because that's, yeah, there's that one track of background vocals, right? Yeah. That's pretty impressive. It is. know guys that that they know their voices that well and sort of like mix. That's the Al Schmidt thing, right? You're mixing as you go, basically. Well, and there's also the concept, if you take it even further back to the maybe even the Phil Spector era and big band and those kinds of things. When those guys set up a mic in a room and it was usually a singular mic, everybody in the band, including the instrumentalists and the singers, were all set at very specific distances from that mic. Mm-hmm. so that they were yeah. getting the volumic volume level volumic volume level of the instrument and or vocal based on the distance from the microphone that was automatically mixed because of how far away from the mic they were yeah and so those old uh sun studio recordings with elvis and stuff right yeah they were just yeah And that's why they did it that way is they didn't have the modern DAW technology that we can use now to essentially approximate any distance or use 
individual pieces and set them in a distance by using the faders in a DAW when you're mixing. When you had right. one mic or two mics that you were using, you were stuck. So you there had you to, go. There's your sound right there. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's your sound. So it's like you have to know the proximity effect and the distance effect to get the volume levels right. And that's why yeah. we think about that. Or at least that's why we're telling you, you should think about it when you're doing your recordings. And with that, we're going to move on to our Friday finds. Chris, what have you got for us today? I read about something that I thought was absolutely amazing uh -oh. and that somebody should have done it sooner, but maybe they weren't able to. You work in Final Cut Pro every I do. once in a while, yes, as do I. And then you know that the audio functionality in Final Cut Pro, let's say, leaves a little bit to be desired mm -hmm. when it comes to adjusting things. So there's this company called Audio Design Desk have come up with an application called Audio Bridge, which actually syncs the audio from Logic into Final Cut. Do they have videos of how this is supposed to work? Yeah. Oh, sweet. I, I need to yeah. see this. So that you can basically, you don't need to transport everything into Final Cut. And then as I tend to do, edit everything there, have to fly it back to mix and do all the kind of stuff and then clean it up, do all that kind of stuff. And then finally back into Final Cut Pro again. Yeah, that's right? a pain in the ass. <laughs> it is. A huge, even, even with OMF, right? It's yeah. like, uh, it works, but it's, oh, it's a pain. But now I guess... You don't have to. You can just leave it there in Logic. I am a little bit suspicious about how it's going to work with, you know, once you start editing and stuff mm -hmm. in in Final Cut. The idea there that now you can stay and just keep Logic running in the background for all the audio needs is amazing. Audio Bridge by Audio Design Desk. And you, sir, what have you got for us? I'm going with those of us who are guitar players. There's That's a me. piece of software out there called Guitar Pro. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that likely use it because it's really good at generally doing guitar transcriptions. Right. And they're expanding on it. Yay. It, there's a new update out called Guitar Pro 8. Obviously, that's a step up from Guitar Pro 7. <laughs> so now it's Wait, version 8. Wait, run that past me again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're one step further down the road in Guitar Pro 8. So they've made some refinements to the user interface, they say, which I literally just downloaded it this morning. I have not yet had a chance to open it up and see what those exact differences are. But my understanding is, is they've also added the ability for people to add audio directly to whatever their transcription is. What the benefit of that is, I have no idea. However, it can be done. I believe you can actually sync it to the timeline of it now as well with, with the audio that you're importing. So you could have like set little loops when you're working on transcriptions so you don't have to go back and forth to a doll or something like that. Oh, well, I so, guess that might be kind of handy, especially if you could slow the audio down to listen to whatever it is that you're trying to pick apart and transcribe. I do know uh, this is something that has been a little bit bothersome to me as I've done some rather hefty transcriptions using Guitar Pro 7 that has bothered me in that if you're doing a bend and holding that bend while hitting another note or two, there's some real issues with how Guitar Pro 7 dealt with that because you have yeah. to use a ridiculous number of ties to account for every single piece of rhythm that might be happening in between things which is not how I'm used to doing transcriptions. And so right. I'm hoping they've fixed that in eight. I don't know if they have yet, but hopefully they have fixed that because that is a pain in the butt. <laughs> right. But it is a great piece of software. Oh, it and, is. And, I you use know, it eight, constantly. I'm sure, is, is, is even better, presumably. So Yeah, and I Very think cool. there's a little upgrade price, and if you don't own it outright, you can still buy the – the full version, and I highly recommend it. I use it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. 
Very cool. Yes. And with that, while we've got your attention, we ask that you go to InsideTheRecordingStudio.com and sign up for our mailing list. Doing so will get you weekly reminders about the Tuesday tips when they come out. And we'll also make sure you don't miss any future episodes of our lovely podcast. Send us an email at goldstar, G-O-L-D-S-T-A-R, at InsideTheRecordingStudio.com with the phrase Mike Distance and you'll get something cool back in your inbox. If you have a topic or suggestion for Chris and I to pontificate upon and explain to you in a future episode, contact us at the contact page, and we'll put it into consideration for a future episode. With that, I'll say, see you next week. Have a good one, Jody. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening, everybody.